Hello everyone and welcome to lesson 1.7 in our historical foundations unit and today we're going to be looking at historical thinking skills part one and we're going to be looking at three particular historical thinking skills. So by the end of this lesson a student should be able to accurately explain and discuss the historical context of a given document or event. A student should be able to effectively analyze the cause and consequence of a given historical event and understand the idea of continuity and change surrounding a given historical event. So the first historical thinking skill that we're actually going to look at today is called contextualization. And this is a very important historical thinking skill that you must be able to master because you're going to have to provide contextualization in every single essay that you write in uh, IB history. And his uh, and contextualization is actually broken down into two different types of contextualization. And the first one is broad context, and the second one is local context. So let's look at the first uh, type of context, and let's look at local context first, because it's the easier one. And the four, local context is basically the four W's, which are who, what, when, and where. So just those four basic W's. So you're looking at a document or an event or, or what have you that you're analyzing. You're just looking at, you know, who is it? What is it? Where is it? Uh, when was it? That type of thing. So it's just the four basic W's. So when you look at a historical event or a document and you're trying to look at local context or look for local context, then you just define what the object is or where it is or when it is you're giving those four the answers to those four questions that's what you're finding for local context and for broader context this is going to be a a larger much larger uh, entity that you're going to be looking at and so you're going to be answering the questions of why and how is more or less the ones that you're going to be looking at and that here's the big thing the big picture that's what the broader context is. So when you're looking at a, a, a document or historical event, you know, what is the, the why did this happen? How did this happen? How did, how did we get here? How did this whole event transpire? It didn't just come out of thin air, thin air or this document. How did we get here? Why has this document been created? We didn't, it didn't just pop out of thin air. That is what your broader context is. It's the bigger picture of why this document or historical event is even important. So for the example that we have here, we're going to do some contextualization on the Declaration of Independence, which is pictured here. So we're not going to read it so everybody, because everybody should, we know what the document is about. So we're not going to read it, but we know what the document's about. So in looking at uh, local context, um, the Declaration of Independence is one of America's founding documents, written primarily by Thomas Jefferson, but also heavily influenced by others at the Second Continental Congress, as well as with several Enlightenment thinkers, such as John Locke, um, and even modern-day political philosophers such as Thomas Paine. Now, the document lists grievances um, that uh, the colonists had against the king and then justified the reasons uh, for the rebellion uh, that the colonies uh, were doing uh, due to the king's violation of natural rights. So that would be a very good local context telling me what this document is. So clearly you know exactly what this document is. You know it's a founding document who wrote it, Thomas Jefferson, where they were, Second Continental Congress. It's influenced by the Enlightenment, such as John Locke and Thomas Paine, and the document listed grievances against the king and justified the reasons why they were leaving. That's the full definition of what the document is. That answers the question who, you know, this document, or excuse me, what this document is. And so that's local context. So in looking at the broader context of the Declaration of Independence, we're going to be looking at those questions of like, why is this document important? How is this document, or how did this document come about? Why is why was this document here? Why is it here? What is the big picture? So let's take a look. Um, the Declaration of Independence was issued in 1776 um, due to a change in political thought as well as political strategy during a time when the American patriots were struggling with Britain's imperial policies. And so and th some of these policies included, you know, unfair taxes um, as well as a lack of judicial fairness. Um, and it illustrates um, a break away from the effort to reconcile because originally colonists were trying to reconcile, but then they decide to go into open rebellion. This is declaring independence, saying 
when this war is over with, we're not going to be coming back to the British Empire. So it's now shifting from reconciliation to rebellion. And so this is a major turning point. So the Declaration of Independence, you know, ushers in a major turning point. And the principles of the document uh, basically become the ideals for what it means to be America and to be an American. So uh, contextualization, uh, this is how you do a contextualization for a document or an event. The second historical thinking skill that we're going to look at today is cause and effect. And again, this is also a critical one that you will need to, to have mastered in order to be uh, very successful in IV history. So let's just jump in and, and dive into practice. Um, so the question is the cause and consequences of World War I from 1914 to 1918. Now, for those of you that remember um, from previous years in history, um, there actually are four. And the acronym to remember always about the causes of World War, cause and consequences of World War One are main. And so there's only three boxes here, but we'll put the fourth one down here. But we have uh, militarism, uh, alliance system, um, imperialism, and then nationalism. And those are the uh, four main causes of World War One, which is militarism, alliance system, imperialism, and nationalism. So obviously with military mili militarism being a, a major cause of World War One. So in militarism, uh, this means, you know, just an increase in uh, uh, defense spending and uh, an overemphasis on military. So the consequence of this militaristic uh, lifestyle that's encompassing Europe is a exacerbation of the English-German rivalry among their navies because obviously the British Navy was very large, but then Germany is quickly starting to fill in that gap and starting to rival the, the English um, or attempting to rival the English. Um, the, uh, the Germans and the French, they have um, had uh, historically had issues, uh, not issues, but have had uh, uh, rising militaristic uh, vantage points along their border. Uh, Germany and Russia was also the same way. So was Austria-Hungary. Um, and as a result of all of these different uh, skirmishes along borders between uh, Germany and France and, and Austria and Russia and et cetera, et cetera, there was a dramatic increase in military spending. And as a result, this is just a powder keg waiting to, to pop. And so in our alliance system, remember we had uh, two different alliances. We had the uh, Triple Entente, uh, which consisted of France, uh, Great Britain, um, and Russia. So these were the allies. And then, of course, the Triple Alliance, uh, which con included Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. But, of course, Italy switched sides later on. Um, but, of course, once you, these are all the major players in all of European, his, European uh, history at the time. And so they have now taken sides. So, of course, if you have the three major players on one side and three major players on the other side, you're just setting yourself up for a system of war. And that's what's going to ultimately happen. With the next cause is imperialism. Um, and so with imperialism, we're talking about the ideas of empire. So you have the uh, British Empire um, that is extremely large. Um, and uh, there's the whole thing for the scramble of Africa. And so, of course, Britain owns basically like kind of three-fourths of the African continent. But remember, Germany was starting to uh, have colonies. And Germany did have African colonies. It also had some colonies in the Pacific, which it lost at the end of uh, World War I. But Germany starting to become much more aggressive. You're starting to see, you know, France has colonies in uh, Africa as well as in the Pacific and other areas. We also starting to see the Middle East starting to uh, gain, uh, gain in traction as the Ottoman Empire is starting to collapse. You're starting to see grumblings, especially with the uh, early discoveries of oil and things like that. And, of course, the shipping with the Suez Canal. Imperialization, all of these European countries are wanting to control these different areas of the world, and this is causing, going to cause potential problems for the European continent. And then lastly, when you look at the last one, we have nationalism. Well, all of these countries are, are fiercely nationalistic. The Germans are, you know, proud of their emperor and they're, they're marching around the continent of Europe. The Austrians are proud of their emperor and the Italians are, are proud of their president and the British are proud of their massive empire. So everybody's got all this, you know, uh, pride. And of course, you know, the French have a score to settle with the Germans over the Franco-Prussian War. So there's a lot of national pride. And so once you mix all of these things together, militarization, alliance system, imperialization and nationalism together, these are the four major causes of World War I. And this is how you would do a cause and effect. 
cause and consequence type of activity. So if we did this for uh, the Suez Canal crisis, you would do the same thing. Here are several causes and here are some of the, some of the things that um, are consequences of those particular causes. And so our last historical thinking skill for the day is continuity and change. And so again, this is another his historical thinking skill that will be highly critical for you to master uh, in order to be very successful in IB history. And so in the example is provided for you is this continuity and change in the Middle East conflicts 1945 to 2000. So I went on ahead and took the liberty of, of putting in a couple of conflicts. This is by uh, and by no means is a comprehensive list at all. Um, but this is just, you know, a quick jotting of a couple of conflicts that you could put on a timeline from 1945 to 2000 regarding Middle East conflict. And so starting in 1948 is the foundation of the uh, nation of Israel. Uh, Israel became, uh, wins a war of independence in 1948. Uh, the Suez Canal crisis happens in 1940, excuse me, 56, when um, Egypt uh, basically uh, shuts down the Suez Canal and uh, it disrupts global uh, shipping and it almost creates a global thermonuclear war. Um, in 1967 we have the Six Day War and this is when Israel is going to completely uh, uh, annihilate uh, almost the entire Egyptian Air Force and is going to completely control the entire Suez uh, Peninsula. In 1979 we have the Iranian Revolution where the Shah is overthrown and we see the Islamic Republic uh, de de being declared in Iran. In 1991, we had the uh, Iraqis invading uh, Kuwait and then the Iraq War, the first one um, in the early 1990s. Um, we had the Lebanese Civil War from 1975 to 1991. And so again, this is just a, a short little list here. But in terms of trying to do this activity for uh, continuity and change, how you would do this is that if this was your timeline, if these were the list of, of things that you had put on your timeline uh, for con for uh, Middle East conflict from 1945 to 2000. The first thing that you would need to do is you would need to decide which one of these is the most important event. And it's totally your choice. That is perfectly fine. That is perfectly fine. But you're trying to look at this like which one of these is the most important event. And let's say that, um, for example, I, would ch I, would make, I might choose the Six Day War. The Six Day War for me was the most uh, important event. And the reason why is because the characteristics before um, Israel borders were the same. So they had had several conflicts before with Egypt and there was nothing, nothing had never changed. I mean, th there was tension, yes, and all that bunch of stuff, but, but border, uh, borders did not change. In 1967, borders changed and Israel's borders did not go back until 1982. And so the characteristics after was, you know, Israel um, is a major military power in that region. And so in 1967, it became very clear, you know, once and for all to all other Arab uh, powers in the Middle East that uh, Israel is significantly much more powerful than you militarily um, because Israel has now defeated um, uh our uh, Arab uh, tension now twice and again eventually it's going to happen again in the Yom Kippur War in 1973 but that's not on your timeline but just this is how you would do this you would decide based on your own opinion and your timeline which one of those events you feel is the most important and then you would tell us what were what were the characteristics of Middle East conflict before the war or before this uh, event you chose, and then what are the characteristics like it afterwards? And so, just like I said, you know, Israel's borders were, you know, defined. Uh, that was the characteristic before, and then the characteristic afterward that they had greatly been expanded. So that's how you do a continuity and change. So our lesson has ended for today. So can you accurately explain and discuss the historical context of a given document or event? Can you effectively analyze the cause and consequence of a given historical event? And do you understand the idea of continuity and change surrounding a given historical event? If you do, pat yourself on the back. You are doing an amazing job. At this point, you want to complete any required activities for Lesson 1.7. And once you do that, move on to Lesson 1.8. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.